Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to the best thriller writers in the world. Now, while I don't put myself in that category of the best, I've certainly got my hat now in the ring. And after nearly three years of hosting this podcast, I think it's time to toot my own horn, if you will. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale all this month. It stars Detective Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat in Hollywood when one of the town's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home only hours hours after winning an Oscar. Beloved by her fans, Pat thinks someone wants this star dead and sees this as a way to forge her own path and get the promotion she craves. I'm proud of the response I've gotten from fans and I'm confident you're going to like The Poser. So for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only five bucks or the paperback for 14. Since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this as a way to help out a fellow thriller writer. There are two ways to reach the link. First, you can go to David Temple Books. Dot com. Scroll down to see The Poser. Click and you're on your way. Or head over to Amazon. You can find it there. Again, davidtemplebooks.com or Amazon. Thanks in advance for your support. And now, on with the show. Your host, David Temple here. Hey, before we get back to the show, I thought I would throw in this one quick note. I have had authors approach me who want to actually advertise on the show. And I'm like, that's cool. I love that idea. I mean, think about it. We feature the best thriller writers in the world. You're one of the new up-and-coming thriller writers in the world to be. And you have a book coming out. Our rates are super reasonable. (laughs) We're easy to work with, as you know. And we all want to work together to make success for all of us. Just reach out to us here at The Thriller Zone at thethrillerzone at gmail.com. Let's talk rates. Let's talk details. Let's do something together in the new year. I think you'll like it. Now, back to the show. Hello and welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. Well, we kick off the month with a special guest. Tom Colgan is VP and Editorial Director at Berkeley. Want to learn something about the business? You know I like to play in different kind of sandboxes, right? Let's get on into The Thriller Zone with Tom Colgan. How are you, Tom? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Excellent. <clears throat> Welcome to the Thriller Zone. I'm super happy to be here. Are you? Do you use the video too, or do you just use the audio? Listen, when you're as handsome as you are, I got to use the video. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you don't mind, do you? No, I don't mind at all. I just didn't know whether you did or not. Yeah. And I just read, because I stalk people regularly, and I stalk you uh, daily, mm-hmm. um, you're actually in the office today, aren't you? I am in the office today. Yep. Now, and according to let's just let's start here because this is one of my favorite things. You you run this thing called the um, and I, at first I didn't quite get it, and then I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, Chronicles of the Quotidian. All right, first of all, that's on Twitter and on uh, Instagram and Instagram. Yep. He he's everywhere you want to be. <laughs> okay. But where where did that start? Because uh, I I love it. Little little daily blurbs of inspiration. So it started actually with a journal, Journal of the Plague, when I went home in March of 2020, when they sent us to work from home, the very first day, which was, I don't remember the exact date, March 16th, 15th, something like that. I thought, well, I'm going to write a daily journal about what it's like to be at home. And I thought, fool that I am, that that would last like two weeks or three weeks. Yeah. And uh, 500 days later, I wrapped it up. And that was hard because I did it every single day. And I was determined to like not miss a day. And then I said, when it was done, I said, well, I kind of enjoyed that, but I didn't enjoy it enough to be doing this every single day. So I'm going to change it to this Chronicles of the Quotidian. And then I, I made a sort of arrang- uh, agreement with my readers that um, I'll do it most days, but there'll be days when I just say like, yeah, I got nothing to say, so I'll skip it. For the, the the plague thing, I did it every day, whether I had nothing to say or not. And one would one could argue reading the thing now, I don't have much to say anyway, so it's kind <laughs> of a moot point. <laughs> I think that's well, the reason I start off with that, and I ask you if you're in the office, because I learned thanks to Twitter that you're in the office because uh, your assistant uh, was given the. The holiday off for the weekend or for the well, holiday, no, she, right? She was, no, she's working from home, but she right. went to, you know, she went home, home. She went right. to Colorado to for the holiday. So she's working today, but she can't um, 
print stuff up or mail it from there, obviously. And why did you have to go in? This is the this is the funny part that it's I love. The crux of the whole thing. So I yeah. have one wonderful author who's terrific and, and great in all regards, a great writer, a great person. Uh, but this author um, really does not work well with um, electronic editing. And, and this person <laughs> is the last author I have who, you know, when we went to electronic editing, I think 20 years ago, yeah, bro. you know, a lot of people were grandfathered into it. There were f- famously uh, at Putnam, Jack Higgins was grandfathered out, out of it. I should say grandfathered out of it. Like Jack Higgins just could not, you know, he was an old typewriter guy. He sent in manuscripts. They dealt with it. Um, this is not as bad as that, but I have an author who can't really deal with it and needs it printed out. So I had to come. So something came up on Friday and I was like, I got to go to the office on Monday and I got to print it out. I have to mail it and all is well, but I don't mind being here. It's not that big a deal. Yeah. You probably get more work done because it's quieter, right? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, it's always quiet because no one ever comes in the office anymore. So oh, everybody works from home. And so, of course, we're not going to say who that author is because that would I'm be not. rude. Yeah, no, be of rude. course not. And it'd be unfair. It's a terrific author. So why? Yeah. Focus and on listen, part of it? and we all got our quirks. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. I, I remember when I handed off. My uh, sister, my sister's got a PhD in uh, English, and she's 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 ten times smarter than I am. And she was going to edit one of my books, and she goes, "Well, I need you to print it out and send it to me." I'm like, "What?" <laughs> so when I read this, I thought of her, and I'm like, "Oh my god, that's so hilarious." Well, I was going to start off a lot of times, uh, Tom, when um. When we uh, start up with a new person on the show that maybe they're just kind of getting adjusted or getting Mm -hmm. comfortable or fitting and so forth, I'll start with an icebreaker. And so this morning and as I was having my uh, coffee and so forth, I thought, you know what, I've got I've got a good little icebreaker. I'm going to run it, Tom, just in case, you know, we got to get warmed up and so forth. So nervous. I don't know what you're leading up to. uh, I love doing that. So. (laughs) We're already warmed up. However, I'm still going to ask you, and it's super easy. What's the most recent purchase that you spent, that you splurged on yourself? And if you need a moment, I've, I've already got mine teed up. So if you need a moment to think about it, I can. Oh, you mean like not a, not like a work, not like a manuscript that I bought? You mean yeah, like, this is like, this is just ice breaking stuff. This is just something you thought. You know what? I'm I'm out shopping. I'm going to get that for uh, Tom here because uh, Tom needs gonna, something. It's going to sound so ridiculous because it's so petty. Um, I bought. Um, uh, hold on. Have you got it? Show and tell. I bought um, winter sneakers. <laughs> They're, they're like waterproof and they're sneakers and like it's kind of dull. I'm sorry. No, 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 I no. Matter of f- hoping, I'd say like a Rolex or something. You know. <laughs> really. Listen, two things. First of all, I'm going to beat you with mundaneness. That's even a word. <laughs> Number two is I have another feature on the show that I was going to debut later. It's called "Show Us Your Shoes." So you just <laughs> not you did you did a two for two for go. one. <laughs> All right, so mine, I really splurged, Tom. I spent $5.78 on a pair of toast tongs. Oh, yeah. We, we've we recently bought toast tongs. I've been waiting for them for years. I don't know why I didn't buy them before. See, you know how many times I have burnt my finger? My my wife has this big behemoth fancy schmancy toaster, and I got to reach in each time to pull those slices out because it'll yeah. pop it up, but it won't pop it quite. I have burned my fingers. Nah. Yeah. You do that thing where you try to snatch them and you pop yeah. them up. And you- <laughs> yeah, so you do the... Mm, mm, right. <laughs> so the other day I said, F this, I'm buying some toast tongs, and I am so excited. Five, $6. I feel so good. There you go. Tom, you can't get this kind of entertainment just anywhere. I want you to know that. I understand. <laughs> Was that a musical cue for me to leave? Oh, you hear that? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. My, um, my email. David, it's time for you to go. No, um, I didn't think you heard that. Sorry. All right, let's do this. Uh, let's back up because the last time I saw you and the only time I've seen you face to face was at Thriller Fest. And you were yep. so gracious to spend uh, 78 seconds with me to say, uh, <laughs> yes, I'd be on your show. 75 seconds more than I wanted to, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, get the hook. Um, so what have you, what have you been up to since then? I mean, I know that you were pretty integral to, uh, that particular thriller fest session and you're, you're, you're always just oh, so one. kind. Yeah. So kind, so gracious, so smart, so on it. And people asking, you know, questions that I'm sure you've a- answered a hundred times, but you're just like, yeah, okay, I'll go for it. So what you've been doing since then? Uh, I've been editing books and buying books and, um, So that was in May, right? So um, what do we do over the summer? Uh, Nothing, you know, out of the ordinary. Uh, uh, Mark Rainey had a new book called Armored that came out that we were super excited about. Um, I I did a lot of editing this summer, a lot of editing, a lot of books. You know, I have a boss who's great. Um, and she believes in like sort of spacing out your work, which was great, except I can never make that happen. And stuff, <laughs> some, some stuff comes in a little bit late and some stuff comes in a little bit early. And all of a sudden you have like a summer that's absolutely packed with manuscripts, but you know, that's the part of the job I really love. So I don't mind that so much, but um, I'm going to put a plug in here for a book that's coming up on December 6th, uh, Tom Clancy, Red Winter by Mark Cameron. Uh, the, you know, Mark writes the Jack Ryan senior books. Yeah. And uh, this one is a throwback story. It takes place in 1985, 86. I don't remember exactly, but it's like 19, the mid 1980s. So it's young Jack Ryan. And uh, I've said this to everybody. When Mark brought this up to me, I was like, gee, that sounds interesting. Let's see what happens. And Clearly, Mark had so much fun writing this book. Mark Cameron just absolutely loved writing this book. You can tell on every page that he is like completely enamored of going back to what is he's about the same age as I am. So going back to our youth, yeah. <laughs> our youths, um, and uh, it, it's just it's a great book. It was so much fun. I, I edited it like the beginning of the summer, so it's really great. Mark is a fantastic writer. Oh yeah. my. Goodness. And what a great dry sense of humor. Had him on the show a while back. And I was, I don't know what I was expecting because I, I stalk, uh, follow him on Twitter as well. And, you know, he seems so uh, reserved and quiet and he kind of is that way. But then you peel back a layer and he kind of, he, he lets the, the gas out and goes for it. So let me tell you my Mark Cameron story. The thing about Mark is he's a great big guy, but like one of these really nice like cut not cuddly but like really nice like friendly big guys uh he's like a santa claus kind yeah. of character. and um he he does he speaks in a very low voice he doesn't get very excited yeah um but he used to be he was a uh he was a, a police officer and after that he was a u.s marshal so he did some serious stuff so he will start i remember we went to lunch uh with some like a, his publicist from putnam or somebody and he starts telling the story, and he, he's telling it in this like ordinary, ordinary sort of like everyday way. And you're listening to it, and then there's a part where all of a sudden you realize he's talking about. So we're wrestling for the gun, and you know he's trying to bite my Adam's apple out, and I'm trying to gouge his eye out, and and it's like at the point I had to stop and go, wait, hey, wait a second wait, this is a true story involving you? This isn't like some made-up story? About it. It's like, yeah, no, no, it really happened. Like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> like, I didn't expect that. So he's so, like, unassuming. It's unbelievable. Now, wait a minute. So just make sure I was following that correctly. Was this a man going to bite his Adam's apple or an animal? No, it was a man. It was a man. Oh, was like, oh okay. Like, or I think the guy was maybe trying to gouge his eye out. So they were wrestling for a gun in a ditch, I think, in Alaska. And I was just like, holy Moses, I did not. This story started off so, like, ordinary. <laughs> it took a left turn. But I guess that's the nature of, that is the nature of law enforcement. I don't just guess it is. That is. so. Yeah. And, you know, I can see that happening to him. And I can see him being the victor. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he was. Well, he was yeah. sitting with us. If he hadn't, yeah. you know. He wouldn't have been sitting there with us. Yeah. <laughs> now he's a great, great guy and a great writer. Really terrific. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to that. When does that book drop by Mark Cam? Uh, December 6th. Oh. I wouldn't usually bring up a book that isn't coming out yet, but it's very soon. So. Wow. 
I wonder if Mark could get on the show uh, right around that time. I'd love to visit him again. Maybe you could. Uh, I'll put in a good word. Yeah, put that bug in his ear because that would be perfect because we're getting ready to wrap up the year with podcasts very soon. Daddy here is going to take an actual couple of weeks off for the first time in 109 episodes. So Really? Holy smokes. Yeah, I mean, Daddy's been working. I don't know why I call myself Daddy. It's third person. It's so weird. D- Daddy's got to take a little break there, booby. Anyway. Yeah. All right, let's do this because... I got a a confession to make. Uh, I don't know full well, full on, exactly the depth and breadth of what an editor does. I mean, I got a really pretty fair idea, as most of us do. But I'd like to know, especially a a guy of your experience, what a... So we're talking VP and editorial director. So you're you're not just sitting there, Mr. Editor. You're the the top of the heap. So I'm trying to find out what an average day for you is like. So let's peel back the curtain. Okay. And- I'd be happy to do that. I will say, though, the heap goes on much further above me. It doesn't end with me. So, uh, But anyway, um, so uh, an editor is uh, – we uh, acquire the books. We mm-hmm. edit the books. I don't know why I'm using these hand signatures, hand signals, but we <laughs> let me back them. out. So I'll make sure I get that. Y'all want to get, <laughs> we, acquire yeah, there the you. Books, we edit the books. Um, we are involved in every process of the book's life. We are the one person in house that is with the book from the very first day to the, possibly the end of its life in the sense that like at the end of the book's life would be um, if it stops selling and the author wants to uh, get the rights back, you know, they come to me and say like, Hey, this book, the author wants to revert the rights to this book. And, you know, I can either go back to the author and say, no, you know, you should really keep it with us or, you know, just agree to revert it. But uh, you don't need to know about reversions. That's not really top of anybody's list of things to talk about. Um, so we, you know, read manuscripts, we read submissions, we find things that we think are going to be saleable. Um, the number one rule of editing was a lot of rules. I always say the number one rule, there's like five number one rules, but one of the number one rules of editing is we're not buying for our own enjoyment. I mean, we can enjoy them. Sure. We can absolutely. I love my books, um, but it, it's not about what I like. It's about what I think will sell. Now, I am very lucky in my career because I reached a point in my life, uh, I guess the old, the, the, you know, when you say a uh, guy with my experience, what you mean is an old man. Um, I've reached the point in my life where those things align. The books that I, the books I love to read are the books that I edit. Lucky uh, guy. But certainly earlier in my career, I did all sorts of, I did UFO books. I did books about angels. I did, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, action, what we called action adventure, you know, sort of Mac Bolan type kind of books. Sure. Um, you know, all sort. I did Westerns. The first thing I did was Westerns. Um, none of these are books that I really love. I, I love the books themselves, but I wasn't I wasn't that interested in the topic. It's just that's what was we, we did and that's what sold. And that's what I did. Um, so we buy books. Uh, we, we negotiate to buy them. We work with the author to uh, bring the author's dream to, to clarify the author's dream. I just made that up. I'm going to use that from now on. Um, clarify the author's dream. Okay. Right, exactly. The author has the vision and the uh-huh. dream, and we're just there to help. We're, the, we're, we're a lens to help clarify that for them. Do you have um, a hand gesture for that? Just, uh, just oh. with the lens to help clarify that for them. Okay. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> And then we do, we are the book's main advocate in house. So uh, we go to cover conference and talk about what should be on the cover. We go to, we launch it with the sales force and tell them how excited they should be about it, why they should be excited about the book. We um, do that many, uh, several times, actually. Um, we, you know, um, deal, you know, we go with the, uh, the person, uh, the intermediary between the author. And uh, the pu- you know us the publishing team like you know uh, we want to send you to well the, you know they talk they do talk directly to the publicist and marketer but we also are involved in those conversations about the marketing plan and the, the publicity plan and all those things um, 
we, we do a little bit of everything, and uh, that's what we love about it. And, of course, we do the editorial, but when I, when I talk about uh, focusing their, their dream, that's the editorial part. That's saying to them, like, you think you're saying this, but I'm confused, so maybe you could make that a little clearer. So there you go. So in a worst case scenario, when, when a project comes to your table and if it's, if you're, uh, this is kind of uh, out there a little bit. So if you're like, oh, I really like the essence of this book. I like, I like what this author is trying to do, right. but he's, or she is going around the bend in some awkward ways. So do you say, uh, I don't know that maybe they don't have the ability to get there or I'm going to say, Hey, writer, Bob or Sally, <laughs> it's always Bob or Sally. I have no idea. Why. Uh, uh, take these notes, go on your way, make it better. So it sucks less and then come back to me. We're going to be on our way. Kind of like that. Yes. In theory. Um, well, you but- can say suck less. <laughs> uh, no, we wouldn't say that. Um, no. So in the submission process, that's more likely in the submission process that you would get a manuscript in and say, well, I really like this part of it or I like what they're doing. I mean, very famously, way, 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 way back, even before I was born. um, uh, uh, What's that book? Um, To Kill a Mockingbird was submitted to an editor and the editor said, Go tell a watchman. Remember the the the. It was, so they submitted basically go tell a watchman, and then the editor said, you know what? The interesting part here is this little bit that you have this character scout and her father. Maybe you should write a book about that. And and uh, she went back and wrote Harper Lee went back and wrote a whole other book that became To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, that is a, yeah. I I feel exactly the same way because you'd have to be some freaking good editor to be able to pick that little bit out and say like, you know, that'd be worth the whole other book. So usually that doesn't happen. Usually it's much more sort of what you're describing. Like you read a submission, you're like, Hey, I really like this. This author can really write, but like, I think a little bit here, I'm not so interested in this part of it, but I'm more interested in that part of it. So then you'll have a conversation. A lot of times you just call up the, you'll talk to the agent, you call up the author, you'll say, Hey, look, here's what I'm thinking. I, I don't like this part so much. I kind of like that part better. Um, but, you know, I think you should put more focus on, I don't know what, you know, the action or something. Um, a lot of times they don't want to do it. Not a lot of times. Sometimes they don't want to do it. Sometimes they like, no, I, I like it the way it is. Or this is the way I feel about it. It might not be the way that someone at Atria feels about it. it might not be the way someone at St. Martin's feels about it. Those people may like it the way it is. So I'm not telling you go back and change it. I'm just saying, I think it'd be better if you did this. Um, and then it's a question of whether they want to. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, you know. Uh, it When you own the book, like say you bought, you published the author's first book, now the author delivers the second book, that's a little more problematic because you actually own the book now. Sure. So now you got to go back to the author and say, hey, exactly what I said before. Uh, There's a little bit here. I don't like this so much. I don't like that so much. There's always some back and forth about that. But, you know, if it's a real big major change, then that can be a problem. But I would say this. um, It's very rare that I'm completely surprised by a second book because we've talked about it. You know, usually when the author, you know, you're publishing the first book. Now the author gets started on the second book. The author and I have a conversation, you know, the author wants to do this. The author wants to do that. I thought of this plot. You know, I don't know. Is that really a good plot? Do you like this better? How about if we change this to that? So we've usually had those conversations ahead of time. So it's very rare that you're just completely gobsmacked by a second book. Right. Um, so I, it doesn't happen that often. I mean, it does. Obviously, it does happen. But another number one rule of publishing is it's not my book. It's your book. Right. So... Unless it's unpublishable, like unless there's something in it or something about it, it's just horrible. You know, unless it's unpublishable, we're going to go with your version. And I've never, never, never in in 37 years um, felt like I reached the point where, where I said, like, you know, the plot that you're coming up with is unpublishable. I mean, I've disagreed. Right. I've disagreed vehemently sometimes. Like, I really don't like this ending. But, you know, if it's your book and you want that ending, that's the ending we're going to have. 
There's a couple of guys that you've worked with that have been on the show. Um, Lies. They're all liars. If they, they all, <laughs> you beat me to it. They all say super nice things about you. Oh, nuts. In that case, they're really good. Yeah. <laughs> um, totally honest. And I'm thinking of one in particular, and you mentioned him earlier. Uh, Mark Graney did a, sh- uh, he was on the show uh, way back when, one of my first guests. And he w- he's just so remarkably down to earth and delightful. You, you think a guy at that stature these days, and, you know, I've been around some pretty sizable stars in my day, but, and you still wonder, oh, is he going to be an asshole or not? And he couldn't be nicer possibly in the world. So interesting thing, and it kind of uh, dovetails with what you were saying. He was on, and we were talking about this uh, audio book he did, or um, the story Armor, and you mentioned it earlier. And so they thought, oh, okay, well, let's make it into an audio book, which I think is brilliant. And we were on the show talking about it, loved it. And then they kind of reverse engineered it into a book or something. How close am I getting that? Pretty close? So it wasn't an audio book. It was an audio play. It was a literal play. Got it. Like, it, like a, like a, like you know, something from the thirties, you know, got it. Fibber McGee and Molly, except with a lot more violence. Right. Uh, <laughs> with machine guns. <laughs> right. with a, it's like Fibber McGee and Molly with AKs. Other than right. that, was like, I mean, almost identical. Go yeah, ahead. Almost identical. So it was a literal play, like you, voices, sound effects, the whole. McGee. Yes. Love um, and then um, we, uh, he wanted to write a book um, based on that. Um, but we added, you know, more thing, you know, because a book is by almost definition long. Well, maybe the reverse is true. So a play or 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 a movie, you know, the complaint is always like, oh, they left this part of the book out. They left that part of the book out. Of course, yeah. because you can't, you know, if you literally did the whole book, the movie would be, you know, five hours long. Right. Right. So uh, the reverse is true. So they did the audio play and then um, Mark added a lot of material and made a whole book out, a whole novel out of it. And that's what we published. We published Armored. But to make things even more confusing, we did do an audio book of the (laughs) book. So it's not the same as the play. It is an audio book of the book and it has a lot more material than the play would have. Wow. Yep. That's called a home run for you, isn't it? I mean, you just <laughs> – that's well, triple dipping, isn't it? Working with Mark is a home run. Everything with yeah. Mark is a home run. He's just a yeah. great guy. He's super nice. You know, talking to him, you, there's never a crossword. It's always about, like, you know, how can we make the book better? I always say that the – I always say this, and I, I say it to him, and I'll say it to you. I say it to everybody. The things that make – the thing that makes his book so good is that – the two people in the world who are least satisfied with each of them is, is the, the two of us. Like yeah. we get to the end and we're like, okay, look, it has to go into production because it's got to actually become a book. But I just wish we could have made this part a little bit, you know, a little tighter, yeah. or that part a little longer. Um, and then we're always shocked. Like the first reviews come in, they're always great. You're like, yeah, no, I guess that wasn't so bad after all. It's so funny. What we worry about most never happens anyway. Right. To quote Tom Petty, um, there is a moment uh, that I was listening to uh, when Mark was on and he said one of the most powerful things. And it was so it's so simple, yet so powerful. And I have quoted it to people who will often beef about this same thing. And it's this. So he's talking about uh, Gray Man, and it gets turned into this TV sh- uh, TV series thing and movies, so forth, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. And we're all just, wow, yes, finally, somebody really sees it. Somebody has the attitude to say, I'm editing there, uh, attitude to say, oh, man, they changed so many things. To which Mark replies, I created the character in the story. That was my job. I was thoroughly happy with that. Someone comes along and wants to option it for a movie and they have a different vision. That's their vision. That's the way they see it, the way they want it. Why would I step in between there and try to tell them what their job is? And I thought, you know, that is such a healthy, remarkably healthy way to look at it and a smart way to look at it because it's business. You're going to get paid. You know, what are you going to do? You're going to go, oh, I didn't like it because he, he left out this part. He changed that. 
who cares? It's now into the hands of someone else who it's their baby. So yeah, that's exactly right. He has a very healthy attitude about that for sure. I love that. You know, I, we, we shut out of the gate talking about editor and I want to know, cause I, I always like to know more. I want to know more at Tom Colgan. What was Tom doing before he was this master editor to the stars? <laughs> He was a college student. I don't, I don't know. Like, uh, I worked at Chase Stadium. I mean, was that interesting? I was like, you know, I sold the uh, hot dogs, Che. I mean, that's, I don't know. That's a great, that's great storytelling right there. I mean, think about that. Uh, it didn't seem that, that wonderful at the time. Um, yeah. You know, I worked at KB Toy and Hobby before that. I don't know. You know, I, I was a college student. I, I started uh uh, I mean, I was an assistant. I mean, obviously, I came to publishing. I didn't become an editor immediately. I was an assistant, right. uh, and then I started doing westerns, and then I moved on from there. But kind of okay, boring. nothing exciting. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Listen, Tom. Everything about you is riveting. Seriously. <laughs> um, <laughs> now you have worked with some of the biggest names in yep. the business. I mean, I'm thinking about Lee Child, mm -hmm. Janet Ivanovich. Yep both of whom I'd love to have on the show. I did have Lee's brother on, Andrew. He was our 100th episode, which was a great oh, way to wow. celebrate. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Tom Clancy, he'd be harder to get on the show right now. And then one yeah. fellow, of course, who's been on the show multiple times, Mark Rainey. Mm -hmm. How how does one, this is going to sound like you're going to probably on your inside voice go, geez, David, that's the stupidest question ever. <laughs> but I'll answer it anyway because I'm on camera. How does one get your attention? Like what? So many ideas, so many books are coming across your mm -hmm. uh, across your desk, and you must go, okay, now, wow, you, I'm not going to put words in your mouth. You're not going to say, well, I've never seen this before. But I mean, mm -hmm. what, what's that? What's that magic sauce? Secret sauce that really gets your attention? Um. That, no, that's not a stupid question. I think that's a really good question. Um, I think that what really grabs me is someone who know, who understands what they're who, who who loves what they're writing. Like I don't think you can fake a passion for what you're writing. I don't. I don't think like one of the things that I say to would be authors all the time. Although I don't speak so much to writers groups as I used to, um, is don't try to follow the market. Don't be like, hey, I got to write a, I don't know what, you know, a vampire romance because that's really hot right now. Right. I mean, you can if that's what you like, but if you don't like it, you shouldn't try to do it because you'll be terrible at it, you know. Right. So um, that's one thing. Um, I think um, s something, one of the things I say to other authors all the time is what readers are really looking for is the same but different. They're looking right. for something that makes them um, not completely out there, not completely something new that they, you know, have never experienced before, but something that's, uh, you know, along the lines of Mark Rainey or, or Don Bentley or somebody like that, you know, um, but has a different twist. There's something about it that's different. I don't know what that would be because uh, I'd write it myself if I could do that, but um, something that makes you think like, oh, this is a really new approach to this, you know? Uh, so yeah, that's a big thing is a, a fresh approach is really the thing that I'm, I'm looking for. Um, and I, you know, I find it more often than, you know, than not, I just saw something uh, over the weekend that I was like, wow, this is pretty good. I really like this. Let me read more of it. So. And I've got to imagine that that is a, a rare occasion because of the volume. I mean, I can't even imagine how many projects you're working on on any given week. Yeah, I mean, it's a relatively rare occasion. Uh, I would say that um, I, I, would, I have a new assistant. I was just saying to her the other day that um, when you think about it, it sounds like we buy a lot of books, and we do. But we, the editorial staff, buy a lot of books. We do, but um, you know, individually, we don't. Usually, I think each year, an individual editor probably buys like fifteen to twenty books, on top of whatever we had before. But you know, fifteen to twenty new books. Um, so that's like well, you know, a couple, one every what, three weeks or something like that. Right. So you know, it's not that 
you know, not that rare. I mean, some of them, but, but, uh, when I say that, some of them are like continuing with Mark Rainey, continuing sure. with Tom Bentley. I'm not saying that they're like 15 or 20 new writers. We definitely don't do that. Probably about like one or two brand new writers a year. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, that was misleading. I'm sorry. I went down the wrong path there. Um, most of them are repeat authors, but uh, uh, but within that, you know, a couple of uh, new authors every year. And what is the ratio of fiction to nonfiction, or are you strictly fiction? I'm strictly you? fiction now. Okay. We don't, we don't do nonfiction anymore. Oh, you don't at all? Well, my imprint doesn't. I used to. You know, I did a lot of it and really enjoyed it, especially like we had an imprint called Caliber where we did military nonfiction. I really, really liked that. Um, but the company just changed things around and said Berkeley is so good at um, – uh, Berkeley and Putnam are so good at um, – uh, commercial fiction, which is going to do that. So break this down for me real quick. So Berkeley Putnam is the top of the umbrella and then Penguin, which I've somehow I'm associating with you is underneath that umbrella. No, 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 no. Oh, so at the top is Penguin Random House. Got it. Then that splits up into Random House and Penguin. Then below each of those, forget about Random House because I don't work there. Penguin then splits up into a whole bunch of other imprints uh, there's like Viking, there's uh, uh, Avery, there's Tartar, there's a whole bunch of other imprints. Um, uh, I work primarily for Berkeley, but I do some Putnam books. And that is part of a, 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 a they're separate imprints, but it's part of a group called uh, Putnam, Dutton, and Berkeley. Um, and they're all run by a guy named Ivan Held, who's a great boss. I put in a plug for Ivan. Can't say enough nice things about him. Um, and uh, Especially if he watches this, if he ever listens to this. We love you, Ivan. <laughs> um, and, uh, but uh, I work primarily for Berkeley. And uh, uh, I, like I said, I do a couple of Putnam books, um, but both of them are basically commercial. Putnam has a couple of nonfiction books. Dutton does some nonfiction. Berkeley does none, really. We just do basically fiction. So Gotcha. If someone were to approach you, like on the street, hey, Tom, we're at this party, we're at this get together, I got this great idea for nonfiction. You would probably say, oh, that's not me, but I'll tell you what, go yeah, yeah. this direction. Yeah, I got that you. That's exactly what I would do. It All does right. have it does, agents come to me, you know, agents who I do fiction with will come to me and say, like, hey, I have this great nonfiction thing, what should I do with it? They, we talk about what it is, and then I say, I'll take it to, you know, so and so. Oh, you just made me think of a great question that has been on the back of my mind. So, you would you agree with this statement that it is in a writer's best interest if you want to be successful as a writer to have an agent? A hundred percent. Hundred percent. If I wrote a book today after thirty-seven years in publishing, I would want to get an agent first and have the agent uh, represent my book. Got it. Mm -hmm. Because I'm talking to some people. Let me take a little tiny. Side street. I'm talking, I'm talking because I talk to so many people. I am talking to authors, one of which I'm thinking of, which I won't mention, who said, oh, I'm going to bypass the agent because I'm going to keep that percentage. Let's not talk about the fact that that's not real smart. And I'm going to go straight to a publisher. That has its benefit if a publisher is, I'm, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but I'm kind of reaching for you. If the publisher is sizable and goes, yeah, we can really do something with this, then you're kind of gold ish. But if it's a small, tiny little publisher who doesn't have a lot of traction, then you're really behind the eight ball, aren't you? I, I think you are. I mean, I think that we, we buy an agent in books. We de definitely, we, we don't do it a lot. We right. do it very rarely, but we do buy books that are unagented. If you come to me and say, like, hey, I want you to read this manuscript, and I do, and I say, um, wow, this is really good, I will go back to you and say, hey, I want to make you an offer for this book. Do you want to get an agent? If you want to go and get an agent, I'll wait here for you to come back with your agent. I will also, though, add, but I'm not going to increase my offer by 15% in order to cover the agent's cost. Got it. So that's up to you. Um, and I might even, if you asked, I might even say like, oh, I can give you a, a, a list of agents. I mean, I, I would never say like, here's one agent. I always say like, yeah. you want a list of agents? I'll give you a couple of agent names and you call them and see if you like them, whatever. Um, I, uh, 
we do buy on agent and manuscripts. I would say, first of all, agents have spent a long time um, working through the boilerplate of the contract that they have with us, right? Our contract, anybody's contract, when they start it, it's going to favor us. I'm not saying sure. it's overwhelmingly favorable to us. It's a pretty much fair contract. But, you know, it, it just by the nature of things, it's going to start out like, you know, being in our favor. So sure. an agent comes in, any agent, and they already have a boilerplate where some things are sort of favorable to us, some things are favorable to the author. I don't know how you're going to figure that out if you're an author. I can't figure that out because I don't deal with all that. I don't deal with like, you know, um, direct mail, uh, you know, royalties. You know, I, I, don't, I don't deal with that. Agents in the contracts department thrash that stuff out. So I think you're missing out on that. You're missing out. Um, uh, well, you would have to give us world rights because if you didn't give us world rights, Who's going to sell your, you know, Czechoslovakian rights? Well, I don't think right. it's Czechoslovakian anymore. Who's going to sell your um, Czech rights? Who's going to sell your um, rights in France? Who's going to sell your German rights? Uh, you? Good luck. I don't know how you yeah. get that out yourself. I wouldn't know how to do that, you know. So I, I just, I think it's better to have an agent. I think, you know, you're going to... An agent knows who to talk to. An agent knows who to submit to. An agent knows, like, what house would be better for you, the author. Uh, in in every way, I think it's better to have an agent. It's worth the 15%. Yeah. I was going to say, this is one of those instances, and I say this to my wife all the time, Tammy. Uh, you would love Tammy, by the way. She sure. and I chat all the time, and I'm like, there is a phrase that you have heard your whole life. I've heard all my life. And sometimes along the path, you go, yeah, 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 but. But I have come to realize in my old age <laughs> that it is 100% true. You get what you pay for. Yes. Yeah. Every single solitary friggin' time, mm -hmm. without doubt. And if my – so let's just let that sink in for a second. Let's just bask in that for a second. So I just came up with it. <laughs> Secondly, why would you, uh, why would you possibly think that you could do to your point? I'm just trying to hammer this point home because it's such a good point that you're making and so solid advice. Why would you trust yourself in an area of expertise with which you have none? I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. No, we've come to an agreement. I'm thankful to say. Yeah, finally. <laughs> we can agree to agree. <laughs> hey, here's the side. As we, we're going to start wrapping up because I know you got a lot of things to do and you're in the office working on a day that you'd like to be home with your feet up uh, while you're getting ready for some Monday Night Football. I'd, I'd be working. Well, I would be, yes, we watch a football day, but I would be working at home. I wouldn't have my feet up. So You can put your feet up and still work, Tom. I'm going to give you permission to do that. That's true. Matter of fact, hold on a second. Uh, where, what did I just see? Oh, I think I saved it. I saved it on my phone. This is how much I liked it. See, hang on. I don't usually do this on the show, but I'm going to do this now because you're special. All right. So this is an, you wrote this yesterday and I loved it. So you're reading uh, New York times. You and I both love oh, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Part of the Sunday routine. So you're writing <laughs> how, People, your average description, you get this average description about what most people say. It's like people, it's like, it's like going to a, a, a personals page like match.com and yeah. I love long walks in this and I'm yeah. studying uh, Italian and la la. And then you find out the person is just full of shit. So I'm getting to a point here and I'm, and I'm not going to read the whole thing because I want people to go to your Twitter page and see it. So they're talking about what they do. And then I go to yours and I'm like, what, what, what does Tom do? Tammy, what do you think Tom does? And then you proceed to tell me now, can I, do you want me to read this? Or you want to just tell me what your standard Sunday is. I love this. Uh, my standard Sunday is so incredibly boring. The whole reason, the whole point of this is that I could not be profiled in this thing because it's so incredibly boring. It's like, I get up, I go to church, I go to seven o'clock mass because the priest wants to rush through that because he wants to get back to his pancakes. So pancakes. I know it'll be the shortest one. Uh, I then get a bacon and egg sandwich from the deli. I go home, I 
take it. I go back to sleep. I wake up in time for usually this time of year football. Uh, I sit on the couch with my laptop. Oh, I might I might have an exotic lunch of uh, a chicken sandwich. And I, if I'm going crazy, I'll switch from white bread to rye. Um, Slow down. I know it's crazy. It's insane. <laughs> Um, and, uh, then I'll sit on the couch, watch football and, uh, be reading submissions. And sometimes if I want to mix it up, I'll go upstairs to the bedroom and sit and watch football and read submissions. Wow. And, uh, you know, then it's time for dinner. And, uh, I think that's it. I don't remember what else I said. I think that's pretty much it. And that's pretty much it. But Tom, how night do you, too. So yeah, there you how, go. How do you cram all that into I one 24 hour period? It's amazing. Well, the hard thing is that, of course, during the summer, we replace football with baseball. But from the Super Bowl to, like, spring training, that's my dark period. I don't know, you know what I do then. Yeah. It's, it's brutal. Oh, well, you know, usually on this show, when I'm uh, interviewing famous uh, authors, up-and-coming authors, too, I ask them as the closing question, what is their best piece of writing advice for upcoming authors? But for you, I have listeners who will want to be an editor one day. So I'd love to hear your best piece of advice on becoming an editor in their future. Ooh, okay. So I would say um, uh, be open to anything. Like, like one of the things I always say to young people is, you know, I, I feel like a big part of the success of my career was always trying to get to yes. So I didn't like, I, there was a part of, there was a time in my career where I would spend, uh, you know, someone would suggest something new. Um, and I think, Oh, this won't work because of blah, blah, blah. And, and then I started thinking like, you know, the problem is I keep trying to think of ways this won't work. And if I switch that around and think like, oh, you know, what's the positives of this? Then, you know, things will go much better. And they did. So um, so pretty early on, I realized that. And I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to say yes to things. And that's why, I mean, my first editorial job was taken on Westerns, which I really had no experience with. But I was just like, okay, well, I'll, I'll give it a go and see what happens. And, uh, you know, I, I think it went pretty well. So there you awesome. go. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Do you, uh, I want to take this one step further. Do you see, you know, we always hear about, I don't know, I don't know when the number started decreasing, but you're going to know this instantly. <clears throat> you heard the, it was the big, it was the big 10, then it was the big seven, then oh, yeah, it was yeah, the yeah, big yeah. five. Yeah. Right. So I don't know how long will it be before the big become, it won't, well, it won't become small. It'll just be bigger. It'll just be fewer. Where do you see, do you have, and I know you don't have a crystal ball, Tom. I got that. Although I'm going to search your website, uh, your Twitter feed to see if you do. <laughs> do you, if you were to make a prediction, do mm -hmm. you see the publishing industry being dramatically different, you know, in the coming years? You, you hear people all the time, oh man, it's shrinking. You know, it's people aren't reading anymore and books are going away. That hasn't been true so far. That hasn't been true. And in fact, you know, there was a lot of trepidation right at the beginning of the pandemic, particularly at the beginning of the lockdown. There was a lot of trepidation about like, oh, this is the end. People can't go to stores and get books and blah, blah, blah. Well, they just bought them online or they just bought, you know, ebooks. Uh, that was shockingly, 2020 was a amazingly good year for all publishers. And everybody was shocked by how great it was. Um, I don't, I mean, obviously, will there be structural changes? Yes, I'm going to choose to probably be bought by somebody, whether it's us or somebody else, I don't know. But, you know, uh, that'll happen. Um, uh, you know, maybe another house will, you know, merge with, I don't know. I don't know. I can't predict that. Yeah. Uh, but I think in the end of the day, people like to read books. I mean, the thing about books that are gr that's great is that, um, uh, you know, for whatever you want, $20 or $25 or $28, um, you're going to be entertained for five days. Yeah. Whereas, you know, if you go to the movies, which I love going to the movies, you know, oh, yeah. now, you know, uh, it's $14, $15 and you're going to be entertained for two hours. Yeah. You know, I love that. But, you know, uh, you know, co co uh, cost benefit, you know, a book is worth it. Uh, so I don't think that that's a problem. I think that that won't change. I think, you know, um, we've reached a point where people who want to self-publish, self-publish very successfully. 
I don't think that that's going to suddenly blow up where a lot more people are going to self-publish. Um, I think the people who are doing it now and are successful at it will continue. There'll be some other people who will join them. Um, but I think there'll always be a place for um, uh, curated. You know, what we do is basically curate for the sure. reader. You know, they come to us because they're like, oh, I like Berkeley books. So this must be pretty good. I like a Putnam book. So this must be pretty good. So um, I think we'll always have, there'll always be a place for that. And do you think a writer can have uh, one foot in both uh, self-publishing and publishing? Like I could come to you and say, this feels like a big commercial success, Tom, help me with this. Yet this little tiny project I want to do on my own, right? You don't have any beef with that, happens do you? All, all the time. happens all the time. This has been uh, a lot of fun. I mean, seriously, I, I, I was I afraid agree. that when I... When I came up and met you, I'm like, I was just hearing this inner voice of like, oh, geez, dude, I don't really I don't want to do this. But you know what? You're you're a charming, delightful guy. <laughs> guy you're like, this guy's a jerk. I don't want to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's always fun. This is one of the things I love about this show because it's not just about thriller fiction. I want to know how the machine works. I want to see <laughs> what makes you tick. What what does an editor do? We had uh, Gina Panateri on here. How, what's an agent oh, do? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love her. And and how do we learn how the machine works? And they're all pieces that fit together. And then on the other hand, I like to know what uh, little gadget you bought for yourself out of the clear blue, uh, which you've got some waterproof shoes. Waterproof <laughs> sneakers. Oh, dear. Okay. See, so everybody wins. Well, listen, thanks for taking time out on your holiday week. And I hope we'll keep in touch. I really sure. thoroughly enjoyed this. Me too. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks again to Tom. What a great guy, right? Learned so much. All right, folks. On next week's Thriller Zone, that is going to be December the 8th, we have special guest W.C. Ryan. He wrote a book called The Winter Guest. It's getting great reviews. Mystery thriller at its finest. You may know him from House of Ghosts. Anyway, join us next week for W.C. Ryan. All right. As you very well know, I've got a lot of reading to do and preparing for the end of the year special edition Thriller Zone. Oh, yeah. It's going to be a doozy. But until then, I'm going to scoot on out of here. I'm David Temple, your host. See you next time for another edition of the Thriller Zone. Thriller Zone.